I like Ike, I shouted over a mic or a phone, but from the highest steeple, yes, I like Ike. In his efforts to promote the candidacy of Army General Dwight D. Eisenhower, iconic songwriter Irving Berlin transformed his jaunty tune, They Like Ike, to I Like Ike giving a musical voice to one of the most memorable campaign slogans in American presidential history. In 1956, the Tin Pan Alley composer quipped, a campaign song never elected anybody, or even got anybody a vote. They're written because even political conventions, like any other big show or spec, need a little musical priming. Likeable Ike's was neither the first nor the last presidential campaign set to song. From the 1840 bid of William Henry Harrison, who was serenaded by a crowd of boisterous ale and vibers, to Hillary Clinton, who entered the Democratic National Convention to the strains of Rachel Platten's fight song, the campaign song has played a noteworthy role in presidential campaign pageantry. Whether played at a rally, convention, or campaign stop, heard on the radio, posted on a web page, or shared through social media, the campaign song can foster the establishment of a presidential persona or brand, communicate the candidate's message, or galvanize a specific group of constituents. During campaign season and after, politicians, pundits, and the public alike ponder over the candidate's words, the visual style of their advertisements, or even the unexpected gaffes, scandals, and controversies that invariably ensue. But indeed, the sounds we hear equally contribute to the constitution of presidential identity. Welcome to the Society for American Music's Digital Lecture Series. I am Dana Gorsalani Mostak, Assistant Professor of Music at Georgia College and creator of Tracks on the Trail, a website that tracks and catalogs the music of American presidential campaigns. So, you might ask, why do candidates choose to communicate through the medium of song, and what are they trying to tell us? How has the campaign soundscape evolved over time, and why might we as citizens want to tune our ears to listen a bit more closely? In this lecture, I trace the history of the campaign song through examples that span from 1840, the first campaign marked by unprecedented musical activity, to the most recent 2016 presidential race in order to shed light on the oral dimension of electoral politics. The typical campaign song from the mid-19th century to the 1970s featured a newly written text set to a contemporary popular song or other well-known melody. This process of grafting a new text onto a pre-existing tune is called parody. Various daily newspapers, published the texts of songs supporting presidential hopefuls during the nation's early years, but the genre did not gain momentum as a discrete musical entity until the election of 1840. William Henry Harrison's party became the first to promote singing as a worthy campaign activity. His supporters circulated pocket-sized books called Songsters so all Whig devotees could lend their voices to the merriment. Voters, and sometimes glee clubs, performed these satirical or didactic ditties at political meetings, parades, and rallies. But not everyone enjoyed the unrestrained racket. Harrison's detractors derided the doggerel and the throngs of unruly singers who attended Whig events. But their obstreperous tactics worked. Tip and Tie, with its memorable refrain, Tip a Canoe and Tyler Too, remains the most well-known of the hundreds of songs penned to support Harrison's noisy but effective campaign. Drawing a comparison with La Marseillaise and the French Revolution, the North American Review claimed Alexander Kaufman Ross's song, Saying Harrison into the Presidency. Tip and Tie's new lyrics, paired with the old tune, The Little Pigs, praise the down-home virtues of the log cabin-dwelling, cider-swilling Harrison, and dismissed his opponent, Democrat Martin Van Buren, as an out-of-touch aristocrat and used-up man. Undoubtedly, this was a slick bit of political maneuvering. The plain-spoken yeoman and honest old farmer lauded in the pages of log cabin songbooks actually hailed from a wealthy Virginia family, owned 2,000 acres of land, and probably never harrowed a field. Mighty waters, waters, waters on it will go, and in its course will clear the way for Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Tippecanoe and 
desire to And with them will be little Van, Van, Van Van is a used up man And with them will be little Van while most campaign songs of this era were based on pre-existing tunes, such as Yankee Doodle or Old Lang Syne, the song We'll Follow Where the White Plume Waves was composed by the famous band leader, composer, and March King, John Philip Sousa. Mired in scandal and rumors of poor health, James Gillespie Blaine's reputation was resurrected in part due to a speech by famed orator Robert G. Ingersoll, who referred to the beleaguered Republican as the Plumed Knight during his introductions at the 1876 convention. The moniker persisted, and Sousa penned the song We'll Follow Where the White Plume Waves for Blaine's third, unsuccessful presidential campaign in 1884. Stand firm from mountains unto seas, and arm ye for the fight. See waving in the loyal breeze, our chieftain's plume of white. Then hurrah for the emblem white, and hurrah for the plumed night. For victory in Blaine, from Oregon to Maine, we'll follow where the white plume waves. Challengers sometimes set smear campaigns to song, drawing on gossip to call into question a candidate's morality. Such is the case with the song, Ma, Ma, Where's My Pa, which refers to a rumor circulating during the 1884 presidential election that Grover Cleveland, Blaine's Democratic opponent, fathered a child out of wedlock. In the end, Cleveland's confession that the child may actually have been his earned him the sympathy and support of many. H.R. Monroe's song features a narrator's voice in the verses, but Cleveland's former paramour and child lament Daddy's departure for the White House in the chorus. Mama, where is Papa? Up in the White House, darling, making the laws, working the cause, up in the White House, dear. When composers pen campaign songs in the 19th and early 20th centuries, they usually gravitated towards folk melodies, minstrel songs, or patriotic tunes. But by the middle of the 20th century, songs of stage and screen were all the rage. Rather than attacking the opposition, as was customary in earlier songs, these peons often published as sheet music lavished praise on the candidate and enumerated his noble qualities. As I mentioned earlier, Irving Berlin reworked a song from his musical titled Call Me Madam for Dwight Eisenhower's 1952 presidential campaign. Buckle Down Winsaki from the 1941 musical comedy Best Foot Forward became Buckle Down with Nixon in 1960. Hello Dolly from the titular musical became Hello Lyndon for Lyndon B. Johnson's 1964 campaign. The Tony Award-winning musical's lead songstress Carol Channing and composer Jerry Herman even performed the song at the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City. You're the man who knows just how to get things done. So Perhaps the most famous song of this era was Frank Sinatra's rendition of the song High Hopes from the 1959 Frank Capra film A Hole in the Head for his friend John F. Kennedy's 1960 campaign. The senator from Massachusetts' presidential campaign team shipped 25,000 copies of the record to Wisconsin during its crucial primary. Whereas celebrities tended to avoid partisan politics during the height of Hollywood's golden age, Sinatra, with his cool cachet and effortless masculinity, ushered in an era where candidates relied on the persuasive power of celebrity to curry public favor. I hope's come on and vote for Kennedy, vote for Kennedy, and we'll come out on top. In his colorful history of the campaign song, Historian Erwin Silber claimed that the campaign song passed into history with the advent of the electronic age. But just as newly composed songs such as We'll Follow Where the White Plume Waves 
and parodies such as High Hopes move to the periphery, candidates increasingly turn towards unaltered popular songs. That is, songs that had already circulated on record, radio, film, or television to communicate their values and vision to constituents. In 1992, Democratic presidential candidate Bill Clinton frequently exited the dais to the strains of Don't Stop, a song that perfectly captured the energy and youthful vitality of his campaign. At his appearances, he offered not only the 1977 Fleetwood Mac hit, but also a larger campaign playlist comprised primarily of R&B, pop, and classic rock oldies that affirmed his political optimism and hip retro taste. Clinton's playlist of songs from his own coming of age evoked the safety and security of an imagined past for baby boomers, the cohort to which the candidate belongs. The Arkansas Natives team emphasized his small town southern roots and branded him as a poster child of the 1960s. So in this regard, the playlist tied into the nostalgic narratives that fomented around his candidacy as well as his campaign platform. While Kennedy was content to let Sinatra's music celebrity rub off on him, Bill Clinton fashioned himself as one when he picked up his saxophone and channeled Elvis Presley through his performance of Heartbreak Hotel on the Arsenio Hall Show. And in doing so, Clinton was constructing not merely his presidential identity, but the identity of the American presidency as well. Indeed, unaltered popular songs offer candidates a new horizon of possibilities when it comes to branding, identity formation, and communication. Tip and Tie and High Hopes might offer succinct and unambiguous candidate-centric narratives on a textual level, but pre-existing popular songs offer up rich histories and a robust network of connotations that could be projected onto a campaign. In other words, a song or a group of songs can communicate a political message, a certain brand of identity politics, an ideology, a worldview, or a set of values. And this effective and persuasive power resides in the actual sounds of the song itself, not just the semantic content of its lyrics. The added benefit of pre-existing popular music is the listener's familiarity with it. Thus, the musical exchange between candidate and constituent forges a social intimacy that a newly composed song or unfamiliar set of lyrics cannot. The effectiveness of wisely chosen pre-existing pop songs is perhaps best illustrated in the 2008 campaign of Barack Obama. Issuing the traditional platforms of his black Democratic predecessors, Obama ran a deracialized campaign, avoiding engagement with race-specific issues in favor of those perceived as racially transcendent. For Obama, Music offered a strategy that would allow him to assert his cultural blackness without disrupting the universalist orientation that defined his campaign. The former Illinois senator stacked his playlist with R&B tunes from the 1960s and 70s, the soundtrack of the civil rights movement, in hopes of forging an alliance between himself and the legacy of early civil rights activists. Although songs such as Stevie Wonder's Sign Sealed Delivered I'm Yours offer a universal theme, love, the sonic qualities of the songs that tell the stories not only signify blackness, but also more specifically display a style of black music associated with racial uplift, mainstream tastes, and bourgeois respectability. For the Obama campaign, hope was a slogan, but it also took the form of a soundtrack that articulated his commitment to community and social equality. Perhaps no candidate in the history of American presidential politics has been so completely and inextricably mired in popular culture as mogul cum reality star turned politician Donald J. Trump, who, like Bill Clinton and Barack Obama before him, turned to the music of the past to envision a new future for his constituents. Trump glorified defiance with the likes of classic rock acts such as the Rolling Stones, Twisted Sister, and Aerosmith. For Trump, and perhaps Mick Jagger, Dee Snyder, and Steven Tyler, the now aging frontmen of these bands, masculinity is white, nonconformist, theatrical, and unruly. But Trump paired grit with performative suaveness and accessible luxury that came in the form of music from stage and screen as well. Jerry Goldsmith's score from the action film Air Force One heralded the landing of his private jet on occasion. 
and tunes from Les Miserables, The Phantom of the Opera, and Puccini's Turandot rang out at rallies. So while Trump may have wished to align himself with the charisma of aging rockers, as a celebrity and reality television star, perhaps he also saw value in aligning himself with fictional heroes. With his playlist of pre-existing pop songs, Trump became, en genre, the leader of Les Miserables' student revolutionaries, the mesmeric and controlling Svengali apparition in The Phantom of the Opera, and president-turned-combat fighter James Marshall in the high-octane thriller Air Force One. The struggles and triumphs of these fictional characters offer Trump a mouthpiece through which he can musically construct his own heroic persona in a compelling and deeply effective manner that reflected the populist leanings of his campaign. But is music just a little priming, as Irving Berlin suggests? Or might campaign songs play a more substantial and integral role in the sustained series of spectacles that constitute the quadrennial campaign? While music may not drive people to the polls and result in an overflowing ballot box, it does have the ability to shape perspectives, attitudes, and actions to a certain extent, or at least reinforce those that we already hold dear. Many of us, constituents and also candidates, consider our preferred music tastes to be an indicator of who we are and what we stand for. That is to say, campaign music does not just shape the character of the American presidency, but the shape of the American electorate as well. In an age where we are overwhelmed with images and sounds across multiple media platforms, it is perhaps even more vital that we develop a critical ear, attuned to the ways in which sound can be harnessed as a tool of communication, liberation, or persuasion. Who's caused this great commotion, motion, motion our country through? His is the ball a rolling on for Tippecanoe and Tyler too, Tippecanoe and Tyler too, and with them will beat little Van, Van, Van. Van is a use-up man, and with them will beat little Van.